All right. OK, so I want to start with the reason why we're here today, and it's actually the students that are here. I started having office hours, and you came to sit with me. And I heard over and over again that the students here wanted to hear from young leaders who are working on the front lines of organizing right now. They wanted to hear from women, young women particularly, and have a diverse panel. So I'm really grateful to all our speakers for coming. And I want to thank all of you for voting with your feet, because if you keep coming to things like this, we can keep doing this. So keep coming. I really do want to encourage you to tweet at the hashtag of Resist Forum. And then lastly, I want to ask you to help a speaker speak. What does that mean? I've only been here for a couple weeks. I've been to some austere discussions. Very intellectual, very calm, very measured. This is not that night. So you can do a couple of things. Snaps, I haven't seen these yet at Harvard. Does anyone? Yeah, that's what I thought. Let's start that. Um, you can say, say that, or uh-huh, if you wish. Maybe even an amen, if you're so moved. Um, come on. <laughs> All right, so there actually is one other man we're going to hear from on the stage, and it's actually Marshall Gantz, who's been a real encourager to a lot of us, actually, and an inspiration. So we're going to have one more man get up here. I think we need a loose mic. He's going to lead us in the farm worker applause. If you don't know what this is, we're going to do it together to have like a spirit of organizing kind of in this place. So I think if Marshall wants to come up and lead us in it, we have a loose mic for you. And this is, the la this is actually the last man you'll hear from tonight from the dais. So Marshall, over yeah. to you. Thanks, Megan. Um, Nico, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, no, when I was working with the farm workers, uh, we uh, used to applaud, just applaud, just applaud. Yeah, that's, that's how we used to applaud. And uh, then a guy named Luis Valdez, who started the Teatro Campesino and was inspired a lot of theater and music and so forth in the movement, came in and, and said, you know, I don't get this. You know, you're supposed to be organized and build momentum, and you just applaud chaotically. So he said, I'm going to teach you how to applaud. And it went like this. Now there's an addition. Um, now for many years in California, anytime you heard that, people said, oh, it's the applauso campesino. It's the farm worker applause. Uh, but we were doing a Latino camp Obama in New Mexico in, in 2008. And a young woman been organizing the Filipino community said, yeah, that's fine, but we don't think it has enough solidarity. So she added this piece to it. Nice. All right, can we do it one last time? All right. Fast learner. So now we're actually ready to start. Now that we're unifying. So this, amen. So this, this panel was originally named Women of the Resistance, and then I heard some men may not come if we called it that, so it was changed to Leaders of the Resistance. But I actually have a third title I want to suggest to us, and uh, I'm inspired by Virginia Republican Representative Dave Bratt, who, when asked about all these town hall forums that were happening in his district, um, said, and I quote, and I wrote it down, because it's a, it's a really serious quote. He said, quote, the women are in my grill, no matter where I go. <laughs> so that... That is a member of Congress who said that. So I would, like, I would like to subtitle this panel, Leaders of Resistance, Women in My Girl. So um, in that spirit, I want to actually introduce our speakers. And I've been really grateful to work with a number of them. And they've gone off and done much, much more impressive things than I got to do with them. But first is Deborah Cleaver, who's the founder and CEO of Vote.org. Uh, Leah Greenberg, who's the co-founder of Indivisible. Andrea Haley, who is the founder of the Civic Engagement Fund. Amanda Littman, who is a founder of Run for Something. And then Jess Morales Raketo from Occupy Airports, who's an amazing digital organizer for many, including Hillary for America. Um, but I want to start off with a quick clip, uh, and it's a clip from CNN, and it's actually going to share with you what Indivisible is up to if you don't know much about the organization, and Leah is actually in this clip. And it sets the stage really nicely, I think, for what, what the landscape is that we're looking at. So I'm going to ask them to play this short clip for us from CNN. Town Hall Fury from Utah. This is what to Nebraska. Constituents chasing down congressmen at public events. This week, aiming squarely at a Congress in recess working in their home districts. The GOP bracing for the protests, the president even noticing. They fill up our rallies with people that you wonder how they get there. But White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer shared the administration's the theory. You know, the Tea Party was a very organic movement. This has become a very paid uh, astroturf type movement. Are you making any money on this? Making any money? No, I mean, no, this is not a money-making venture. Meet the team responsible for the movement, 
Three former Democratic congressional staffers. We had seen a very powerful local activist movement, the Tea Party, emerge. And so we knew exactly how powerful local action could be because it had been used against us very effectively. Days after the election, based loosely on Tea Party tactics, they sketched out an online guide for progressives of how to stop Trump's agenda. Um, when we put it out, we had hoped that I think our parents would like it on Facebook. It was, you know, 10 people were reading it, and then 20 people were reading it, and then 90 people were reading it. Then it crashed. They posted what's now known as the Indivisible Guide on a website, now viewed 15 million times, downloaded by 1.7 million. About 7,000 Indivisible groups formed following their step-by-step -step guide. Once you're part of a team, there are four simple tactics to engage in. A viral video followed. Brave New Film says their $10,000 video was crowdsourced from five to $100 donations. The guide's authors have now filed with the IRS as a nonprofit. There's one full-time employee, Ezra Levin, who still hasn't been paid. Three weeks ago, they put up a donation tab on their website. Only small donations so far, they say. Their movement growing based on a simple idea. No is a complete sentence. That that's a smart move because it keeps your coalition together uh, and it allows you to have the greatest impact possible. I was just so inspired and motivated by what they said. Um, do, you, do you know the people who wrote this guide? No, I couldn't tell you their names. This is Ann Taylor, grandmother and founder of Virginia's Indivisible 757. None of the people here work for a political party. Their target tonight, Republican Congressman Scott Taylor. How do you feel when the GOP brushes you off as somebody who's paid? I, I think it's funny. I think it's a desperate attempt to delegitimize what they must most definitely perceive to be a powerful grassroots movement. Right. So I want to start with you, Leah. Uh, you know, I worked with Malala for, for three years, and I have a, a huge heart for young women in, in leadership and emerging leaders. And the thing I took away from working with her is that history is in the business of using unlikely people. I think we tell ourselves this myth that if you're perfectly prepared and you have a strategic plan and you have all your funding lined up and everyone in charge told you it was cool, then you're going to be OK. And this is the exact opposite of your experience. So mid-December, you start. You have 7,000 groups registered now. So. You know, we've seen this surge in civic engagement and activism, and the question that we hear people talking about is like, how do we make this moment into a movement? How do we take this inflection point and make sure it doesn't dissipate and become something that has strength and power and perseverance? So how are you doing that at Indivisible? Um, first of all, thank you so much, and, and thank you for uh, everyone to the, for the chance to be here tonight. Um, it's, it's really such an honor. Um, we. I, I think that by far the most common um, single theme that we hear from the, the thousands of folks who have written into us um, who are either organizing or participating in um, local actions related to the Indivisible Guide is that they, you know, maybe they voted, but they did not consider themselves to be political. They did not consider themselves to be an activist. And um, this election had a, a really significant effect on how they saw the world and their feeling that they needed to um, be actively engaged going forward. And I think that's really exciting and really powerful. Um, I think that for us, a lot of what will help us, what will help sustain that is really getting people, getting people connected, getting people you know, off the internet, off the, off the Google Doc and into a room with each other, um, getting people connected with existing activist groups that have been doing really powerful and important work for a long time and um, helping to sort of build the connective tissue that will ultimately sustain long-term action. Yeah, that's so good. And we'll take a clap. We'll take a clap. Um, you know, as you're, as you're looking at Trump, I know like the big, the big convening, uh, the center of this has been, you know, activating against what this concern, this deep concern about many of Trump's policies. What are the strengths and weaknesses of that? You know, is, is there a great strength in that? Is there a downside in that? How are you seeing that play out in the field? Well, there's no question that Donald Trump is um, sort of a, a, a unifying force in the sense that he's unifying a lot of people against him. Um, yeah. I think that there is a danger at the same time to treating Trump as ahistorical and discounting um, the conditions that, that led to and enabled and um, drove his rise um, as if they, they aren't currents that have been part of American politics for a very long time. Um, and I think also a danger in, in treating him as sort of a unique uh, while, while I think he is in, in many ways a unique threat, um, treating his agenda as uh, really distinct um, 
from and, and totally separate from a, a relatively standard Republican agenda. Um, and so recognizing that sort of at the same time that uh, Trump is a mobilizing force for a lot of people who are, who are perceiving a really unique and dangerous threat at this moment, um, taking the opportunity to sort of ground that in the, the broader politics that have been going on until now, um, I think is really important. That's so good. So I want to move to Andrea Haley and your work at the Civic Engagement Fund. And I know that you have a big focus and heart on finding ways to bring resources and changing how we're investing in reaching communities of color around elections, around civic engagement, and then getting people to run as well, and finding ways to fund groups that are working on that. What led you to focus on that? Why do you think that's so important? And how, how do you think we can make sure this is actually an inclusive movement and a diverse movement, right? Instead of saying we have just a diverse set of speakers, how do we really show that we value diversity and inclusiveness in this progressive movement in a real way? Um, I think in, I started my work because in the wake of the election, I wanted to go back and take a look at um, budgets and where money was placed, uh, especially in battleground states with millennial communities of color. And, I, um, and through taking a look at some of that work, I was a little bit disappointed to see that a lot of um, a disproportionate amount, and a number that I would say is not even a quarter of the $2 billion in, the, um, in, the, in this last election cycle went to uh, communities of color and outreach in those communities. And so I really wanted to take a look at, well, what are we doing to empower grassroots activists on the ground um, who know their communities best and um, and when I saw that there was a need, I looked around and said, well, who after the election is gonna see this problem and develop a, a, a solution? And I kept looking and looking and it didn't come. So I, I founded Civic Engagement Fund um, with the idea of trying to take a look at who got things right in the last election cycle. There were grassroots groups that did a fantastic job. And so how do we empower them to the best of our abilities to help them scale? And how do we make sure they have the resources and the funding that they need? Um, and where are we? And then where are we missing each other in communication? I think another big thing from this election cycle is that, especially when you're talking about millennial communities in general, and also millennial communities of color, is that um, we have a strategy in the Democratic Party of putting a lot of money into TV dollars and. Um, in advance of the election, I was looking at different friends. I was pulling resources that they had and that they had red flagged, and and they and I saw these polls that said, you know, 23% of millennials get their information on TV. Well, if we're only communicating on TV, then really we have a problem there. So I think that when you hear that the election could have changed based on the protest vote, millennial protest votes, um, there's been a lot of blame in that, and I think that that really. Uh, the blame is really on our consulting culture um, instead, because what, what are we doing in our campaign culture, what are we doing to proactively meet people where they are and engage with them there and really listen to the, their concerns? And then how do we all move forward together in concert? Um, and I think that um, right now, I think it's really important to kind of get in early, build infrastructure early, invest in communities early, start listening now um, in advance of, of the next election cycle that, so that hopefully we can mitigate the, the low turnout that always occurs um, in midterms and, and, and really engage people. It's not enough to say this is really bad. We have to then go ahead and connect the dots to say uh, this is really bad and here, here's how it affects you and here's what we can do to move together to do something about it. You know, and I think that that's, that's the piece that's um, uh, been missing a little bit, and I, I, think that we can, uh, I think we can change that by investing early. Yeah. And I know you grew up in a political family. Your father was the first African-American head of the American Trial Lawyers Association, which of course puts a lot of funding into political races and political action, and you learn to follow the money, right? Because priorities are usually revealed by budgets and where dollars are spent. And I love that you're looking at research and, and asking people to self-report about what they're spending in engaging communities of color, and particularly younger voters. And I think even looking at when that money came in, I know there's been stories of people that got last minute checks to engage communities of color a week or two weeks before the election when really they should have been building that infrastructure much sooner. And that reveals the lack of prioritization of these communities. And you know, is there any other interesting things you're starting to see as you're starting to do this research, which is such a powerful tool. The numbers speak really loudly. Sure, we, we found um, uh, 
there, there were groups that found ahead of the election that you know 59% of um, millennial communities of color in battleground states reported not being uh, not having any outreach uh, at all, hearing from any group. Um, and so, and again, that goes back to this idea of of you know TV dollars versus uh, other types of media and other types of organizations that can be invested in. And um, sorry, what was the second part of that con that question? I think he answered it pretty well. Actually, okay. <laughs> I think you're um, right. uh, so I think that. I think that following the budgets is always really important. And one of the things that everyone can do is, you know, as, as the new campaign cycles start up, ask, ask people who are running for office, ask your um, members of Congress what they're doing to, um, how, how much resources are being allocated towards building coalitions. Um, because I think it's only in unity around our diversity that we're going to be able to move forward, resist with the most amount of impact, and ultimately, um, win elections again. So, so paying attention to those budgets and then paying attention also to who are the decision makers and, um, and on, on that and, and from a media perspective too, what, what's the makeup of these different firms that are giving the advice to campaigns and do they have an inclusive environment that, can, that has a high level of cultural competence? Because it's, it's very, if you don't, if, if you've never, experience the lived experience of a population, you're going to have a very difficult time messaging correctly um, and really reaching hearts and minds. So um, I think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned there for, for campaigns. And then also as we move forward in a resistance to make sure that we're all um, inclusive and, and moving together in, in concert, I think it's going to be of the, I, I, think that's, I think that's how we win the future. Amen. Yeah, I'll take an amen on that, yeah. And I think it's so, it's so important too, it's not just entry level campaign staff, it's senior campaign leadership, it's media consulting firms, it's digital strategists. I think sometimes we, we staff up and people say, oh, we have diversity, it's the same thing as the Bay Area. You know, it's like, well, diversity looks a lot better if you look at entry level employees than when you look at who's in the C-suite or who's actually on leadership and management teams making big decisions about money, priorities, strategy, and that's, that's gotta change. So I wanna shift talking about the Bay Area to Deborah. So to Deborah Cleaver from Vote.org, and I actually want to show another video. She just gave a killer keynote at the Lesbian Who Tech conference last week, I think, but we're actually going to show a quick pitch video from Y Combinator. So who's familiar with Y Combinator? Um, you know, so it's an incredible kind of startup incubator accelerator program in the Bay Area, and usually, you know, they take in companies. Uh, and so this was extraordinary that Deborah got in as a civic engagement platform and driving voter registration, voter turnout. And so this is actually her pitch talk from Y Combinator Investment Day, Investor Day, right? So this is when different people come from the Bay Area to say, why should I give you money? This is her three minute pitch. So if anyone here imagines themselves giving a pitch someday, you're about to get a masterclass. So I'd love to play the video if we have that queued up of Deborah. Hi, my name's Deborah Cleaver and I am the CEO and founder of Vote.org. Vote.org is a high impact nonprofit organization that reaches more voters per dollar spent than any other group in America. My team and I have spent the past eight years proving the obvious, which is that technology is the fastest, cheapest, easiest way to increase voter turnout. Now, some of you may have noticed that 2016 is a presidential election year. And on the off chance you somehow failed to notice this, just take my word for this. 2016 is a presidential election year. Which means that all sorts of other groups are also doing what Vote.org does. In fact, partisan groups will spend a record-breaking $10.2 billion this year on competitive races. And along the way, they're actually going to register millions of voters, which is great. But they're going to spend almost the entirety of that $10.2 billion on antiquated strategies with incredibly low ROI. So Vote.org is a tech group. We use technology, and it costs us on average $4 to register a voter. Everyone else is spending between $12 and $315 to register a single voter, which is patently absurd. So if you're interested in high ROI, please don't give your money to a candidate or a campaign or a super PAC or even another nonprofit. If you're interested in high ROI, Give your money to vote.org and we will send hyper-targeted text messages to unregistered voters in swing states encouraging them to vote. And we're gonna use text messages because they're cheap, they're easy, they're efficient, and be very easy for us to scale up. So this is what the rest of the year looks like for us. There are 77 days until the presidential election 
And I'm gonna need the people in this room, like literally you guys, to help me raise $600,000 over the next 15 days so that we can directly contact 1.2 million potential voters in swing states and encourage them to register to vote, which means we will be running one of the largest voter registration drives in American history and absolutely the most cost efficient. So I'm gonna leave you with something to think about. The Clinton campaign currently spends $15 million every week, which is actually considered relatively cost effective for a presidential election. Votes.org only needs $13.2 million to directly contact every single unregistered voter in America and permanently increase voter turnout. So when I say that we are a high ROI, high impact organization, I absolutely mean it. I'm Deborah Cleaver. If you have any interest in American democracy, please come talk to me. <laughs> Okay, so you can say a lot in three minutes, apparently. Um, that, was, that was so well done. So I, I asked Deborah, I was like, okay, Deborah, like, what do you want to talk about in this panel? And she wrote back, I want to talk about the 40 million voter turnout drop-off that's expected between the 2016 and 2018 election. So with that dark framing, Deborah, like, how, how is Vote.org going to address this like, in a midterm? In a okay. midterm, what's the plan? I don't know why I do these things to myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what we've spent the past two months or so thinking about. So first, the plan was to quantify the drop-off because even my friends in politics were like, that big? And I was like, yeah, that big. Because we always tell ourselves it's like a 33% drop-off and just saying it's 40 million like causes people to pay attention. So define the problem, then some hand-wavy stuff and then solve the problem. But what we're actually looking at right now, I want to be clear that this is still pretty rough, guys. It's like two months past the election, is how do you actually make someone a lifetime voter? Like, how do you help them move from voting as a hobby to voting as a habit? And all available research, and there's actually very little research on this, shows that you get someone to vote in a presidential election, and then you get them to vote again in the very next midterm election. And then you don't need to chase them anymore. So the time and money that you've spent on them like, actually pays dividends for decades. So we're still working on determining what percentage of people who voted in this election voted for the very first time. Uh, the most recent poll, I keep looking at you because I feel like you might know, but the most recent poll I've seen <laughs> is showing about 15% of the 136 million people who voted in this past election voted for the very first time. Mm. So that's about 20 million which means of the 40 million people who won't vote in the next election, like 20 million of them are actually worth our time and money to invest in. So from there, I'm like, well, how do we contact 20 million people? Which I actually think is a totally reasonable question. Um, so we have a habit, see, Jess is like very encouraging. Jess is down, she's ready to go. Uh, <laughs> Well, what we like to do is just buy everyone's private data and directly contact them on their phones. So that is our first strategy. We're gonna buy like contact information for about 20 million people, and then we're gonna staff up, and we're gonna get around all the existing can spam and like telecommunication laws by hiring humans to send actual text messages. Um, is that true? Yes. If, so if actual people volunteer, because I remember you were posting updates on social media and you were like, I've got this army of 40 people just texting away in real time. And that is how you get around that yes. guideline. We actually had 100 people uh, in a room and they weren't volunteers. We pay them $20 an hour. Um, and we bulk upload by like millions contact information and then they use a program to actually send them to send them text messages. So first we'll try to contact them via text and then we're probably gonna layer on, of all things, surprising coming from me, mail, uh, because you need to like touch them each probably about five times and then if we can, no, we will buy their email addresses so we'll hyper target them on Facebook um, and then I'll see if we can partner with Google so that we can also target them when they log in to their email. Have you told this to Google yet? Uh, the founder, of, the creator of Gmail is one of our big funders, so I'm gonna nice. shoot him a text message. Probably <laughs> can't be like, be like, PB, I need a favor from you, which is the way <laughs> what like does that all- text message look like? Yo, you up? It's literally like, gonna say. <laughs> 
it's literally going to say, I need a favor from you, don't say no. Uh, and then we'll go from there. And I figure at five touches per voter, being creative about it, um, we, we will not like knock on their doors because you can't. It's expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. Um, it's often ineffective. Most doors go unanswered. He's just nodding. Yeah. Ninety yeah. percent of text messages are read within three minutes or so. So we'll do a lot of that, um, and then we'll use 2018 to run a bunch of like just crazy experiments, and whichever ones work best, we'll do again in 2020. That was a very precise answer. Okay. Good. All right. Well, there's there's an action plan. It's good to know. I feel better about the 40 million. Um, I'm it's only on. a week old, though, that plan. <laughs> it's like literally brand new. So we'll see. We'll see next week. So I want to I wanna give a warning to the audience in about mm, like 10, 15 minutes, we're going to start asking questions or taking questions from the audience. So start thinking about your incredible question now. But I want to go over next to Amanda Littman and run for something. So we want people to vote. We want people to organize. We want it to be diverse and inclusive. We also want people to run. And so this was like a side hustle. Like this was a side hustle at first, yeah. right? And then became the center of your universe. And so if I have this right, I wrote this down, I couldn't believe it, 6,000 people have signed up in one month to run. Yeah, we're up to 7,000 as of this morning, which is awesome. Seven, come on, it's so good. Yeah. And so the, the vision was to build this bench, right? A progressive bench for the party mm -hmm. and to have it be young, millennial, diverse, and up and down the ticket, right? Up and down the ticket. So if somebody in here is wanting to run number one, they should go to run for something. But but what would be your best place to advice to them if they want to do that now, if they want to do it in a couple years, if this is an idea, a vision that you could do this someday? So here's the thing to keep in mind. Uh, Donald Trump is president. You can serve on your city council. Um, you are smarter. You are a better listener. You are um, more willing to go out and talk to people. Like You can run and you can win. These local races uh, for school board and for state legislature and for city council are small. They are relatively affordable. Um, the way to win them is not by big TV ads or even radio. It's by knocking doors and talking to people and listening to their problems and saying, I care about the same thing and I can help solve it if you elect me to this office. Um, you are smarter and a better listener and a harder worker than the President of the United States. You can be on your city council. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing that keeps baffling me as I look at this and keep doing more and more research and talking is how many races go uncontested. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2016, nearly 40% of state legislative races were uncontested. Uh, on the lower level, in city council, uh, school board, the numbers are unbelievable. In Wisconsin, it was something like only 5% of these small villages in Wisconsin had contested elections. Uh, in Cook County in 2015, 63% of the municipal races went uncontested. Los Angeles County literally canceled elections. Uh, 24 out of the 88 cities canceled elections between 2004 and 2014 because there weren't enough people on the ballot. The only reason that qualifies someone to run for one of these local offices is because they raise their hand and are willing to do it. Yeah. You can do it. We will help you. Um, and that's the thing is that I think one of the reasons that we started this organization is because the Democratic Party um, and the institutions that previously existed were not welcoming to new people. They were not places where you felt like you could go ask for help. They were scary. They were political. Um, and they were under-resourced and couldn't really help you if you, if you asked. Um, We'll do that. We'll help you navigate the system. We'll help you find the money and the training. We'll give you money if we can. We'll help you get on the ballot. And we'll connect you to mentors who've done this for years and can help you navigate the landscape. Girl, you're ready for Y Combinator up in here. That was amazing. All right, so that was <laughs> Please give me your money. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, what is this idea of a bench? Yeah, I'll stop at that. The, uh, the bench, building the bench, you know, and like, I think this is, this is a real issue that I've heard all of you talk about. And, you know, it's like you go to the Bay Area and you figure over the age of 30, like, people will not give you capital. They're like, you are too old to make a difference in this world. And you're like, but I have an amazing idea. You go to the halls of power and people are like, you are not old enough to make a difference in this world. You need to hold on, you know, and we'll let you know when you're ready. And so this, do you feel like there was anyone else quite connecting the way that you have? Like, what do you, is it the, the set of tools you're bringing, the sense of community? Is it a now thing? Like, why do you think this um, is connecting in this way? I think part of it is we set a sort of arbitrary age limit of 35. Um, part of that is because that's the technical definition of millennial, a word I hate. But it's also a way to make sure that if you are between 20s and early 30s, this is a welcoming place for you. You're not going to get boxed out by someone who has more experience uh, or someone who may think that they're ready. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot from especially young women and people of color is, I'm not qualified, my resume is not good enough, who am I to ask for votes from people? Excuse me, but uh, mediocre white men never ask themselves that question. <laughs> they never do. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 
No excuses. No, no there's no excuses. Um, they just do it. They feel entitled to it, which is sure, fine, but we should also feel entitled to it, um, and we should feel ready to and be able to ask for help, and there's incredible organizations that will help you from Emily's List to Emerge, Pathway Projects, Higher Heights, Latino Victory Project, Victory Institute. Um, there's incredible places that will ask for help if you know to ask them, um, but if you're an outsider poli to politics, you might not have. So that's one of the things we're trying to do. It's so good, it's so good. <laughs> so I, I love what you're sharing about people not feeling ready or able or having the permission. And I was talking to Jess Morales Rocchetto from Occupy Airports um, before we came out and we're talking about origin stories. Does anyone know what an origin story is? Like usually it's from like comic books, right? It's like the superhero, it's like they get bit by the spider or you know, like something happens. Um, I would talk to Malala about this all the time. She would be like, my life is like a Bollywood movie where life is perfect and all of a sudden something bad happens and then somehow you overcome and it ends up really well. Except there was yeah. no dancing, unfortunately. Um, there were no dance scenes, but we're still hoping. Can work on that. Uh, yeah, but we <laughs> talked about origin story and the, and the fact that you cannot, you could just not feel ready. You know, you cannot feel ready. You know, what was the origin story for Occupy Airports? Like, how did this start happening? So this was the organizing around going to airports. I found myself in Dallas Airport. Um, you know, that Saturday myself. Thank you. you know, it's a lot of people in this room probably went out as well. Like, how did that start to take shape? How did you get? to be a leader in, in organizing that. Yeah, um, origin story, uh, I learned from Marshall Gans how to tell my story of self. You probably don't know this, Marshall, but you taught me how to tell my story at the New Organizing Institute, um, which is now defunct, but uh, had done incredible organizing uh, for a long time. So that's sort of what I'll do right now. Um, and you should take Marshall's class so you can learn. Um, <laughs> I am, uh, I recently came off of the Hillary for America campaign. I'm Hillary Clinton's number one stan. I wanted to uh, work for her since I was nine years old. When I told her, I told my mom I was gonna be the first woman president, except if Hillary Clinton was the first woman president, then I would be the second woman president. Um, so I was on her campaign um, for almost two years and was, I still would say that what I would call what I am is in grief. Um, it feels like trauma. I gave everything over to it, and we lost. Um, and so I spent like that time, you know, in between Occupy Airports and HFA, like figuring out what could I offer, what could I bring, what could I do, and also feeling like I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I, I have it in me. I've been an organizer for um, for ten years, and I just felt like. Maybe I'll cash out and like go to Facebook or something. Um, and uh, I actually uh, am on an email listserv with other organizers. And um, one of them was sending people to JFK. She works for an amazing organization called Make the Road New York, which is incredible community organizing work, especially with immigrant communities in New York City. And they were sending people to JFK, JFK Airport. Hundreds of people were already getting there. But at that time, there was really like less than 100 people at JFK, JFK Airport. And she said, can somebody look and see if there are other airport protests? Like, is anybody else going to any other airports? And I was at the museum, and I was meeting my friend, and she was late, and I had five minutes, and so I started looking on Twitter. And I saw that there were some people, or there were people asking if there were other people at airports. So then I literally tweeted, protests, JFK, go there now. And the next tweet was, do you want to like go to the airport in your community? Get in a car and go to the airport. That's how Occupy Airport started. Then people started tweeting at me. I'm going right now in <laughs> <laughs> Rally Durham. OK, great. Protest, Rally Durham, right now. <laughs> Terminal 2. Like this was the sophistication of the organizing that we were doing. There were no, there was no voter list. <laughs> there was no, there was certainly no money. Like I. I wish somebody would pay me. Um, <laughs> we, it was just people who were uh, saying that they like wanted to go. So things started taking off, people started moving, and I'm, I'm literally just like a thread of tweets. Then I issued a call on my Facebook page and I said, um, hey, anybody at the airports, tell me now. I'm trying to aggregate. I called my friend Gerard. We have a website that, because um, we're working on a project together, and I said, hey, can you get this up? Don't make it look pretty. I need it up in the next 15 minutes if you can. Five minutes later, he put up the ugliest website in the history of life, <laughs> and it said, it said like, protest rally Durham and link to the tweet. Like, uh, again, this was not sophisticated. Um, <laughs> and suddenly I realized, and then I was like, okay, well, what else can we do? We can uh, find out what all the international airports are, because that's where the flights come in. 
that's where they would be stopping people. So I looked up what the top 20 airports are that accept international flights every day, and I was like, all right, those are our targets. It's like a thing you learn in organizing. You gotta figure out where your targets are. Uh, and so then I issued a call. We need people urgently in Miami and Los Angeles and Sacramento, da, da, da. Okay. So my favorite story about this is there was a teacher in St. Louis. At some point we did get um, people pro like organizing protests in every single uh, international, like those top 20 like international cities. Um, then other people started being like, can I, we're not international, but can we go? I was like, sure, go to the airport. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> also, like, why are you asking me? I'm not in charge. Uh, <laughs> you are. <laughs> so I wrote back to a teacher in St. Louis, and she said, well, I, I think I want to do this, but like, how do I do it? And here is the sophisticated organizing advice that I was giving. Find some friends. Text them right now. See if they will go to the airport with you. Get in the car. Pick up the friends along the way. That way they can't bail on you. If you can, make some signs. Chant a couple of things. Here's two chant ideas. <laughs> and go to the airport. <laughs> They're going to tell you that you can't stay. That's all right. Just keep chanting and don't move. Um, I'll do my best to send a lawyer to you. Because at that point, I was like getting people who were like, I'm a lawyer. I'll help. And then this was literally, I was connecting St. Louis, like teacher St. Louis, to like lawyer St. Louis being like, you guys might need each other in case they try to arrest you. Like, <laughs> um, and we organized, uh, you know, hundreds of protests all around the country. I don't know how many people, but um, I, I believe that hundreds of thousands of people attended protests. We got media and basically every major media outlet. Um, and like, I think what I, what I really want you to know about this is like, I'm not in charge of Occupy Airports. No, none of us are in charge of the resistance. We just got on this panel at Harvard, which is very exciting. Um, <laughs> and I'm very <laughs> pleased to be here. But ultimately, like, you are the resistance. The Democratic yeah, Party is yeah. not the resistance. Vote.org, 1%, they're not the resistance. Come on. You are the resistance. We are the resistance. It doesn't take any, you don't need any special skills. Like, I mean, I guess like you've got to know how to tweet maybe, but even then, I think that's not even true. Um, so I hope that all of you feel like there, you have ownership over this because you do. Um, and it's not just for millennials and it's not just online. It, it's like, it's for everyone. We are all a part of it. And I hope that you like take away from this that there is nothing stopping you mm -hmm. from marching on campus or you know, at your local PTA meeting or like, you know, I don't know who represents y'all, but like perhaps they need some friends at a town hall. Like, it, it, that is what is going to be the next four years, and I hope you all are there for it. So good, so good. All right, um, this is the moment where you're getting ready with your question. If you want to start going to the mics and lining up, I'm going to ask the panel kind of an open question. A couple things, we'd love for you to say who you are. We want to know who you are. Number two, do not give a speech masquerading as a question. Don't do that up in here. Like, come, come with a question. Um, try to keep it short so we can get to a lot of people. So I want to start with you and answer. We can just do a quick lightning round. So um, I have three words. Wait your turn. Yep. Um, so as a Latina organizer, like, what, what do you feel like was the moment where you were like, I am not waiting my turn anymore. I, luck rewards the bold. I think the ground's going to rise up to meet you, and I'm just going to start doing this. And, and how can other people learn from that? I think probably for me it was uh, at, after the 2012 election cycle, um, there were a lot of men getting credit, um, data and analytics men, like getting credit, mostly white. Um, and I was just so mad at that because that like, well, just wasn't true. That's like not who made Obama win. Like the, the volunteers were women, the, the four deputy campaign manager, or sorry, three deputy campaign managers and political director were all women. And the people under them were getting the credit. And so I uh, did like a tweet storm. I don't know why this always happened to me on Twitter, but I did a tweet <laughs> storm uh, that was like, here are 10 women that you should be putting in your articles instead of these same old white dudes. And most of them, like most of those white dudes reported to these women. And I, this was like the day before Thanksgiving. I went away and I came back. I had hundreds of notifications on Twitter. All my friends were tagging me on Facebook. And it was like, she said what everybody'd been thinking. I wasn't uh, anybody special on that campaign. I was like a junior staffer. Um, and uh, I realized then that courage and um, the truth like always have resonance. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of That's helped good. me realize that like I was never going to get what I wanted if I just kept my head down and worked hard, which is like a thing that happens, I think, in particular to Latino communities, frankly. Um, it's just like, just keep your head down. Don't let them notice you. Um, and I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to get noticed. Come on, I love it. I love it. Anyone else like have a 
wait your turn moment where you decided, I know Andrew, you and I have even talked about this. Like you were saying, I have this idea, I feel like I gotta do this, but I'm surely someone else is doing this. Or like, what was the feeling for you about making that decision? I kept looking for, you know, um, I had a lot of new friends or friends were calling me and saying, how do I get involved in the wake of the election and what do I do? And then I didn't have anywhere to send them. Where do I put my dollars and things like that? And, um, and past some of the usual suspects, I couldn't help them to do anything new and innovative with their money and, and, and ways to invest in grassroots organizations and invest in the, um, in the resistance. And so I just um, kept looking for who I could connect them to and who I could, you know, um, and, I, and I wanted to be in service of another organization that did such a thing and I realized it wasn't going to happen unless I did it. So that was the moment I think that I um, uh, stood up and just decided to go ahead and, and do uh, what needs to be done. And I think, you know, at, at a certain point, there's always something that pushes you to have had enough. And when yeah. you've had enough, you, you engage and you step up. And I think that's yeah. it. But so many people don't make that decision. You know, and I think we always talk about leadership and it's like, I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna get a degree, I'm gonna have like the perfect strategy, I'm gonna go to a training, someone's gonna mentor me, I'm gonna be, you know. It's an inside game. It's so much of leadership is an inside game. It's a decision, it's an inside game, and I think we have to say that out loud. It can't just be about, look at this amazing thing I've done and I'm perfectly quaffed and was perfectly prepared, and like I just don't meet leaders if that was their story, but I feel like people don't say that enough, especially to young people, so good on you. Anyone else, a last like, wait your turn moment? I see people, everyone can say if you have a quick I, answer, do it. I have a funny answer. So the organization that became Vote.org was my side hustle for seven years, which I probably didn't mention. I think we became Vote.org before we had any staff members. You used to post pictures on Facebook of your cat and say it was the CFO. I mean, tech, <laughs> so if you actually look at the Vote.org org chart, like there is in fact a cat and then like everyone else. Um, we just find that it helps with leadership. But no, there's actually, it's actually like a funny side story. So this was my side project. And in 2012, my side project, which was then called Long Distance Voter, registered 100,000 people on like $1,300. And no one ever told me that I had just finished running one of the country's biggest voter registration drives. <laughs> and like, I had a day job, so I had no idea. And I figured if we did that on $1,300, then obviously everyone with like human staff who didn't have day jobs had run a much bigger program, and someone mentioned it in passing once. It was like, oh, NOI, there was an organization that was verifying everyone's number, and they called me about the typo in the thing that I had submitted <laughs> with our budget, and they were like, was it, there's something wrong with the budget? And I was like, oh, it's like 1,300, why do you ask? And they were like, oh, we thought it was like 1.3 million. And I was like, well, where would I get 1.3 million dollars from? Like, I have a cat on fundraising. But, I mean, just, no one mentioned it. Like, no one told me that I had just finished accidentally running one of the country's biggest voter registration drives. And, and then once I did start fundraising, then people had like a lot of opinions about my work. But like, someone even told me that it didn't count because we didn't spend money on it. But I was like, but we also didn't spend time on it. So it's, it's weird what happens when like, as a woman, you're like, wait, 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 wait. I think I can do this thing. I mean, literally, someone said it didn't count. I was like, OK. So I, don't, I just found it funny. Um, oh, so you should just ignore other people would be my <laughs> advice and like do life, the thing. Life wisdom, Debra Cleaver. Yeah. And anyway, any last, last quick answers from either of you? Yeah, I will say, so we, I like Jess, worked on Hillary for America. I was her email director, the other emails. Um, uh, great job title. Um, <laughs> after the campaign, I like Jess was grieving. I was sad. I was so goddamn angry. Um, and one of my former bosses, John Carson, who was the two, 2008 Obama field director, um, wrote this Facebook post that was like, the institutions that you are waiting for have failed you. You expected them to win this election and they have disappointed you. Don't wait for them. Step up and do it. Amen. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hate that I had to read his Facebook post to feel like I was empowered to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it pushed me and it made me realize I, I'm angry. I have time. I'm newly unemployed. Uh, <laughs> and I can do this. Um, so we set up a website, and we found some of our friends and political advisors to, to say that they would lend credibility. Um, we happened to have a friend who had an in uh, Politico's playbook who would plant it on January 20th. And we launched with a beautiful website and me sitting on my couch with my dog answering a lot of email. Um, and in a month, nearly 7,000 people have signed up to run. We're raising really good money. We have more than 1,000 volunteers. I'm faking it, but it's working. Oh, come on. I'm faking it, and it's working, and it's amazing. And nobody gave me permission. 
Um, and this is what I think is true for local candidates too. No one's gonna give you permission, you can do it. Awesome, awesome. I don't know, do you have a, anything or do you wanna answer questions? Let's go to the questions. Let's go to yeah. questions. <laughs> I think. Let's go to the floor. All right, I'm gonna start right here. If you wanna say who you are and your question. 